we had a lot of great, great times together. Really, we did. Spent a lot of good years together. I was married to him for 10 years. And uh, then it was, we agreed to disagree. Just didn't work out right. No one's life is ever all perfect. And that's what I used to think as a kid. But once my parents got divorced, I kind of was opened up to a new world that I'd never really seen before. And I think that's helped me really grow as a person. It doesn't matter who you are, or what is your background. Uh, if you uh, believe in yourself, uh, you can do it anywhere. If you don't do it very well, at least you survive. You have your own lifestyle. You will not die hungry. You will help your family back where you came from. So with a lot of faith in the eternal one, the eternal God, and uh, in yourself, I think you can conquer those uh, small barriers in life. I think when future generations look back, they'll say how silly we were for some of the things we did because they'll understand things better in the future and they'll criticize the older generation for, for not knowing better, but we didn't know, right? When I was about five years, or maybe four, when I was about four years old, he taught me to say, if you persist in your present behavior, I must expostulate upon your conduct with unimpeachable impunity. And apparently I whipped that on my kindergarten teacher. She must have thought she really had a problem. <laughs> Part of your job when you're becoming a doctor is you, once you get your degree, you then help train the other young doctors in how to do things. And I train surgeons, you know, who are in training, so teach them how to do surgery. And I love teaching. And I came home and I said to Aaron, you know, I don't really love being a doctor that much. It's okay. I really think I want to be a teacher. I don't know exactly how it was when I remarried. I'm, probably, I'm guessing around like nine or ten, but I'm just, that's a total guess. Maybe between eight and ten, I'm guessing. Uh, because there was some semblance of a family, there was, she had that matronly role, I guess, but to me, she didn't seem like a mother. I, was, I didn't look at her like a mother, not because she, was, she wasn't like Joan awful, but I just didn't look at her like a mother, no. When I went away to college, I sort of studied a very general kind of liberal arts curriculum, and I really didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, even when I graduated from college. Um, after college, I moved here and I took a little time off and I decided to go back and get my master's in social work. But even at that time, I really didn't know specifically the population that I wanted to work with until I had my first, uh, actually my last field work placement, my internship. And that was at uh, the therapeutic school that I ended up working at for 12 years. And I just, I walked in there and immediately knew that that was the population I was supposed to work with. Experience in life sometimes uh, guides you for a way you're not expecting to do. I never think I would have the calling to be a minister. And um, as soon as I get involved with inner city people, uh, do a Bible study, help people visit hospital, I feel like calling, like something I was doing good, I like, and I like it something you have a passion and probably a vocation, I don't know, but um, sooner or later you get involved with stuff and um, I just go into this area and I pray to God because I, I, I'm a pretty observant people in, in religion and I pray and I feel that calling. I, I kind of feel, it's kind of weird, but I do feel like I was born a nurse and that's why I am going back to school so that I can do that at a different level. I, Probably one of the most important things in my life was going to Israel when I was 13 with my parents, my grandmothers and my brother, seeing a society where um, for the very first time I didn't feel like I was part of a minority group. Growing up in the States, I was very much aware of the fact that when, when it was the winter season, it wasn't winter season, it was Christmas, and going to the malls, going to the stores, watching TV. Um, always felt like there was a holiday out there, everyone was celebrating, and we just weren't a part of it. Even till today, the exception of Adam Sandler's stupid uh, Eight Nights of Hanukkah, uh, there's nothing on TV, there's no movie that uh, deals with my holiday. And while a lot of people try to turn Hanukkah into the Jewish equivalent of Christmas, 
It isn't. It's different. But going to Israel and being part of a, a society that was speaking Hebrew, celebrating Jewish holidays, um, making sure that the needs of non-Jews were met, it was really an eye-opening experience for me uh, to be part of the majority culture and to feel like having been part of the minority culture, we knew now how to treat those who were not Jewish. I, I, I mean, music was always sort of around, around me, but um, I, I did not, I wasn't quite sure what, you know, what to do. It was kind of tricky growing up. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't, you know, I wasn't quite sure what I would like. But, um, uh, so I wasn't, I wasn't, it wasn't until I was 21 that I decided I would be a musician for a profession. I would probably like to do more ethnic food. Uh, maybe some more Japanese and uh, French dishes. If, if I knew that the kids would like it, I would do that. I've worked with a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of entrepreneurs over the last 22 years. And I only believe the ones, like actually would invest in them, want to partner with them, do business with them. I only believe the ones who can tell me a story about a time where they really messed up. Because in order to take risks, they're not all, you have to go, the whole point of taking a risk is that on the other side of that risk, you might succeed and you might fail. That's the definition of a risk. So if somebody isn't a risk taker, there's no such thing as a person who's taken risks and only succeeded. So you have to really, really fail. You have to fail hard. In the beginning, you have to fail often. And you have to be able to pick yourself back up and figure out what you learned from that and then do something different the next time. That's a really good lesson for anyone who's setting out in the world to do something big. I attended bar here at the Lucy's Pub for how many years? For a number of years. They called me the, what did you call me? Uh, we had Geezer Mondays. Oh yeah, I was the, yeah, we had ge old Geezer Mondays because we they had the old Geezer bartender, that was me. <laughs> I didn't have the natural talent of a lot of kids, but I worked hard. Um, but my boss, Ludo, uh, Aaron in Indianapolis, he ran the club where I worked for seven years before I came here. And uh, I mean, he did everything. He was the laziest, hardest working person I've ever met. I mean, I had one morning where he called me at like 6.45. I had to be up at 6.50 to get the courts ready. And I'll never forget this. I, I pick up my phone and I hear, hey, um, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm, I'm sleeping, Ludo. And he goes, oh, right, well, I'm crazy comfortable right now and I'd have to roll over to check and see if it's raining. Do you think you could look out your window and tell me if it's pouring? And I looked out the window and it was raining. I went, yeah, it's raining. And he hung up on me and I went back to sleep. And so, but later that day I got there and he was, he had put down about 70, 80 pounds of tennis clay by himself. So he's one of those people who recognizes that as the boss, you have the prerogative to call somebody and have them check if it's raining, <laughs> but then he'll do all the hard work too. Yeah. So. He was the kind of person where if something needed to get done, he got it done. It's like one single cell from you, yourself, all of a sudden start growing without, uh, without respecting any rule or anything and becomes stronger than you. So the, the tumor grows and, and, and becomes stronger, but the tumor is not smart, although it's strong, it's strong because it kills its host, and then it's f finished uh, dying as well. So that's why I went to study cancer, to understand how, how your body let this happen. Tell us about your family. Um, uh, which family? <laughs> like, um, which one, my Korean family or my American family? Oh, so, um, Okay, so I was adopted by a family member when I was two and a half. So I still have, you know, my real mother passed away when I was one. And so my real father was way too old to take care of me. So I was adopted, moved here when I was two and a half. My mother here is actually my aunt who married a pretty waspy guy. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much my family. They came from the old country. They came from Palermo, Italy. When, when we moved over here, they had an intentions of going down in the basement and crushing grapes and making wine for the family. And that was back in 1954, so I'm celebrating almost 60 years here in the same location. My brother um, was not around a lot, so I pretty much was 
brought up as an only child because as I got older, he was already out of the house. So, and I don't remember, um, he was in a lot of trouble. He was sort of a troubled child when I was growing up, when we were both in the house. So we had a good relationship, but like I said, as he got older, he was gone and I pretty much was alone at the house. How can I phrase this? I was doing advertising and I was tired of doing brand building for other companies because they didn't really appreciate it. Because I would do these wonderful ideas and clients would say, eh, we don't really like that. So that made me frustrated and I said, well, I can create my own brand. So I started doing this, both as a way to create my own brand and to raise money for schools. I don't know, you know, that's part of our mission here. So it was started off really as a passion and as a kind of way to show people how to build a brand, you know, from scratch. But I've learned over years not to get frustrated and just understand that, first of all, not every idea that I think is good, other people think is good, and I'm totally okay with that. And even if other people do think it's good, it sometimes takes years to make a change. I decided to be a librarian when I was in the sixth grade. Mrs. Berg, my teacher, made me work in the school library. I thought it was a bad idea, and then I found out I loved it. Because there was no librarian. The, so, the, the, the library was at the end of the school cafeteria with the, you unlock the doors and open it up. I was in charge. It was a road to power, and I've never been disappointed. Working at the school, I really honestly feel like there were some kids that my team and I actually saved, for sure. Well, all I can say was I married him, he was a bachelor, and he didn't understand family. He didn't understand children and grandchildren. And when I wanted to see my children, we only had one car, I couldn't take the car. And that became very hard for me to accept that I couldn't visit my children and my grandchildren. And he just didn't quite accept the family. And so we just had to separate. People always tell you think outside the box, be creative, have different ideas. But the fact is, there are a million ideas out there, but a good idea is really only an idea that actually gets implemented, that people actually do. In 1945, I appeared on a show called uh, 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 The Morris B. Sachs Amateur Hour. It was on Channel 7. And it was a, a, a weekly television show that was on between 12 and 1 o'clock. And I came in third place on that thing, and I lost to a lady that was a ventriloquist and a violin player. So you couldn't beat that. Well, I don't really see what they throw away, but if I do see it, it, it gets me sick because there's a lot of kids that don't have anything to eat. So I wish they wouldn't take it if they don't want it. Or take a little bit, taste it, and then come back if they want more. So I opened a salon, um, God, it was probably about 10 years ago or so. And then I had that for a few years, built that up, um, got a little burned out. So I decided to sell it and decided to open up a Korean restaurant instead. So I opened up a Korean cafe, thought that was fun. So I decided to open up a bigger Korean restaurant. So I did that. And then, you know, it was a terrible, the economy was awful at that time and probably not the best decision to open up to within a year. So close those and opened up the salon again. It's what I know. My tennis career ended with a tweener winner, which was sweet. Uh, my freshman year, my very last point of the season, I ended a match running a ball down and hitting it backwards between my legs for a winner and then blew my knee out the very next practice and that was it. So both of those were, were cool moments, I think in a place where there's a vacuum, where people are not doing the right thing or people are not standing up for the right thing or people are not serving in the kind of leadership roles that are needed, try to be that person who fills that vacuum, who fills that gap. Be what you know you need to be in order to do what has to be done, whether that's doing tikkun olam, fixing the world, or simply getting one small, achieving one small objective that's important to you that other people are, are ignoring. I, th I think that's probably the smartest, most important statement I've ever found. And uh, it's definitely uh, 
a teaching that guides my life. Think big, and you know, that's pretty much it. Think of the big idea, and don't settle, and don't rest until you come up with a really good big idea. Be open, be ready, keep learning, and keep going. I think that if somebody was to go out and do something, just continue to do it until you fulfill your obligations to do it. Don't, don't give up on it. Although things have changed in the music business, I don't know whatever someone is going to do, I would suggest you just keep on doing it until they fulfill their obligations to do it. That's the only way I could explain it to you. I, don't, I just don't really get it. I, I, I don't understand. I don't, I don't understand prejudice in any form. I don't understand racism. I don't understand all those things where people judge others mm -hmm. for their size, color, race, sexual orientation. And I just say to people, be accepting of other human beings and be loving and be kind. I will do everything again as the same way as I did. I will do it 100% over the same thing again.